क्या हुआ बे? अबे रॉकेट गाय बने हुए हो ग्रेजुएशन के लिए सिर्फ चार महीने बचे और समझ नहीं आ रहा आगे क्या करूं? शुरू कहां से करूं? अबे इंटर्नशाला ट्रेनिंग से मैं बताता हूं। यहां है मशीन लर्निंग जावा एच आर टेली जैसे बहुत सारे करियर बिल्डिंग ट्रेनिंग ट्रेनिंग सेलेक्ट कर और अपना करियर शुरू कर इंटर्नशाला ट्रेनिंग शुरुआत यही से हेलो एंड गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन आई एम योर होस्ट मनप्रीत अरोड़ा वेलकम टू दिक्स सीजन ऑफ आई एस टी प्रैक्टिकल बाई इंटर्नशाला ट्रेनिंग आई एस टी प्रैक्टिकल इज अ सीरीज ऑफ फ्री ऑनलाइन मास्टर क्लासेस डिलीवर्ड बाई इंडस्ट्री एक्सपर्ट्स दीज फोर्टी फाइव मिनट सेशन आर ऑल अबाउट टीचिंग स्टूडेंट्स इंपॉर्टेंट कॉन्सेप्ट सॉफ्टवेयर एंड टूल्स एवरी आई एस टी प्रैक्टिकल इज एन अपॉर्चुनिटी टू एक्सपीरियंस द पावर ऑफ प्रैक्टिकल लर्निंग in today's episode we have mahin rashid who will be teaching you embedded systems mahin is a director at tree bottom electronics private limited he graduated from kerala university in electronics and communication engineering in 2006 he is interested in product development and teaching electronics to beginners and professionals i hope you will enjoy this webinar with him we have a very special gift for you at the end so stay tuned for that तो चलिए करते हैं अम्बेड सिस्टम्स सीखने की शुरुआत यहीं से एंड लेट्स वेलकम महीन थैंक यू मनप्रीत फॉर द इंट्रोडक्शन हाय एवरीवन आई एम सो हैप्पी टू बी ऑन दिस वेबिनार प्लेटफॉर्म होस्टेड बाय इंटर्नशाला सो इन दिस सेशन आई विल बी लुकिंग फॉरवर्ड टू शेयर यू विद माय आइडियाज थॉट्स एंड एक्सपीरियंसेस ऑन द टॉपिक इंट्रोडक्शन टू एम्बेड सिस्टम्स सो बिफोर वी गेट स्टार्टेड आई हैव टू पोल क्वेश्चंस फॉर यू they are very simple questions if you know the answers please type in the comment box on the youtube streaming channel so the first question is name a few microcontrollers you are familiar with so please type in the answers in the comment box you could type in uh, those microcontrollers you that you might have learned in your college or maybe that you have worked for a project or even the microcontrollers that you have just heard about so please go on and type inside the uh, comment box yes uh, shoaib ali has uh, typed it as 8051 yes that's one of the first microcontrollers stm32 is a very popular microcontroller these days arduino is not a microcontroller arduino is an ide is an integrated development environment we will be looking at it shortly uh, in fact arduino you know is the board that's uh, used by arduino ide atmega32 is a pros is a good microcontroller is a very popular microcontroller yes raspberry pi is also a microprocessor so thank you so many students are typing in lot of answers most of the answers are very good yeah so that's the first question so that will set the tone for our webinar now let's go to the second question name a few operating systems you are familiar with so here also like the previous question uh, you could type in the answers of operating systems that you might have worked with or maybe you have learned in college or maybe you have just heard about please type in your answers operating systems yes linux is correct answer by mohammad farid and then danish malik has written arm lp2148 that is the previous one windows is also an operating system yes unix harish jaiswal has written linux so so many students are writing it as linux yes windows mac linux by shubodit kosh so okay you guys uh it's very fantastic to have a wonderful audience like this so let's build our webinar on this fantastic interaction so let's move on to the objectives of this webinar so, so the first topic we will be discussing is what is an embedded system so in this topic we will be discussing some of the examples of embedded system we will also be defining what an embedded system is and also we will be discussing some of the attributes of embedded system then we move on to discuss what's inside an embedded system we will be discussing both the software as well as hardware elements of the embedded system in this particular topic then we discuss embedded system development so here we will be discussing uh, the phases that an embedded system project goes through and also we will be discussing some of the tools involved in the development of an embedded system project then we have a project demonstration where we do a project in tinkercad after that we have a case study specifically on burglar alarm we will be having a discussion on its block diagram its software flow diagram and also its working and finally we have the questions section so next let's move on to the first topic what is an embedded system 
So first, let's look at some of the examples of embedded systems. So if you look around, most of the devices around you are actually embedded systems. Uh, the television examples include television, refrigerators, washing machine, toys, and so on. So what is the most uh, common element in all of these embedded systems that's around you? It's a computing element. The computing element is actually the processor. So let's see that in detail. The computing element. The computing element could be a microcontroller or a microprocessor. There are several differences between microcontroller and a microprocessor. We will deal with that shortly. So the computing element that's available in all the uh, embedded systems that's around you as, as is, the, is the common element. Now, the central processing unit is a fundamental block of this computing element. The central processing unit or CPU is a fundamental element that does the processing uh, in an embedded system. So the central processing unit is actually made up of ALU and CU. ALU is arithmetic and logical unit whereas CU is control unit. So what does this ALU do? ALU uh, is given instructions by other uh, sections of the processor. It operates on this instruction. That is, it does the arithmetic and logical operations and uh, executes the required functionality. Now, whereas CU, CU does all the timing operations uh, for, for ALU to perform the execution. So the CPU is the fundamental block of a processor and it is made up of ALU and CU, ALU is arithmetic logic unit, which does the arithmetic and logic operations, whereas CU is a control unit. It provides the timing signals to perform this operation. So as I said, a microcontroller differs from a microprocessor in several ways. It differs in the form of architecture. It differs uh, like the amount of memory uh, available, number of buses available. So there are several differences, but it won't be possible for me to discuss all those details in this short webinar. So if somebody asks you about what is the difference between a microcontroller and a microprocessor, you can write this statement. A microcontroller has a whole system, including memory, peripherals, and processor available in a single package. So that is the big difference between a microcontroller and a microprocessor. Whereas the microprocessor mostly has this computing element alone. So microcontroller, whereas the microcontroller has all these uh, elements like memory, peripherals, and processor all available in a single package so that it could be used where uh, the system, uh, where, where the cost is uh, very important. So suppose you want to make a product and the cost is very, uh, you, that product is very cost sensitive. So instead of going for a microprocessor, you can choose a microcontroller. But there are uh, some drawbacks for using microcontroller because like performance might be uh, a little bit less when you are uh, using a microcontroller. However, the technology advancements these, these days have actually blurred the boundaries between microcontroller and a microprocessor. Today, even microprocessor are getting more and more integrated with all these uh, blocks like memory, peripherals, processor, processing element, and so on. So let's see some of the factors influencing the selection of uh, a processor. The first factor being the processing capability. So depending upon the functionality required, like, for example, if it's a media processing device, for example, the set-top box device in your home, it requires high performance. So high performance processors are needed in a uh, set-top box. So depending upon the processing capability, a processor has to be selected. The second topic is cost. So if it's a cost-sensitive application, you have to uh, uh, choose between processors like uh, uh, maybe like you, you, may, you may have to go with microcontrollers in certain cases where you have to uh, you have to reduce the cost. So cost is one factor. The third factor is power requirement. So high performance means high power is also needed because there will be more power dissipation and there will be multiple voltage rails uh, for the processor to perform. So power requirements also influence the selection of a processor. The other, another factor is availability. For example, we just passed a pandemic now and chip availability is very um, tough these days. So you have to select a processor based on its availability. You can't choose, you can make a product by choosing an obsolete, that is a, an obsolete processor, that is a processor that is not in production. So you have to choose a processor that's in production. So availability is one factor that influences a processor selection. And the final uh, factor influencing the selection of a processor is, uh, is its a software tool support. So just because you, you have a processor in the market, uh, you can't simply go and uh, use it to make your product because uh, you might run into errors 
some expected errors will be there and some unexpected errors, errors will be there. So whatever the error might be, uh, the, the chip supplier has to support you with the right tools. So if the tool support is not available, it won't be uh, feasible for you to make a product using that microcontroller. So software tool support is also one important factor that influences the selection uh, of a processor. So now let's define what is an embedded system, a microprocessor based system built to execute certain functionalities and is not designed to be programmed by the end user in the same way that a PC is. The second part is what actually differentiates an embedded system from a, a PC. So with an embedded system, we can decide on the functionalities and the requirement and the requirements earlier itself, but we can't change it later by simply changing the software or hardware. That is, you can buy a set of box, but you can't change its features and functionalities just by changing software. It's not possible, but with the PC, this is what we exactly do. Uh, you might think that this definition is very hard and fast rule kind of thing, but it is not so. Uh, today, the technology advancements has, has actually blurred the boundaries between PC and an embedded system. So uh, from my experience, I have a different perspective on embedded system. So let's see that. That's a practical perspective. So in my idea, an embedded system is actually a computation box. So it does some computations on some kind of data. So where does that data come from? That data come from uh, keyboard storage, like USB or hard disk, or maybe wired connection, like, wi like, like Ethernet, or maybe wireless connection, like Wi-Fi, or maybe serial cable or parallel cable or USB cable uh, such, from such sources. So the embedded system receives data from some input source, like I have listed here, like input pins, keyboard storage, and wired or wireless communication sources. So it receives this data, and it does some computations. And after doing some computations, what it does is it transmits this data to some place, just like input to output data, like just like output pins, or maybe to display, to display some image, or maybe to display some video, or maybe to storage, like to hard disk, to save the information in the hard disk, or maybe to remote destination, like um, uh, over the internet, like through wired or wireless communication medium. So this is uh, my perspective of embedded system from a practical perspective, from a practical, uh, from a practical side. So embedded system is actually a computation box. It does computations on data received from the input source, and it does some computations. And after that, it transmits those data to some output uh, destination. So let's see some of the attributes of embedded system. Attributes means features. So most embedded systems are designed to be uh, perform a single or a dedicated task. For example, the washing machine, it performs the job of washing. Refrigerator, it does the job of cooling. So embedded systems are designed to be uh, designed to perform a single or a dedicated task. And the sec ne next attribute is uh, most embedded systems are designed to be standalone. So what do you mean by standalone? The embedded system is mostly deployed in field. So it has to run with less human interaction. It cannot be stuck at a particular situation. It has to resolve out of that situation by itself. So by design, most embedded systems are standalone systems. And the third most important property of embedded system is intellectual property protection. So you know that in a competitive market, the technology of the product is very important. The competitor should not copy your product. With an embedded system, this technology is within a program. This program is burnt inside a silicon chip. So without knowing, uh, without having the know-how of how to uh, retrieve this information from, from the silicon chip using an external hardware or sort of, uh, you can't actually copy the product. So intellectual property protection is enabled in embedded system by design. So these are the three most important attributes of embedded system. So now let's have a quiz. I have, have a question for you. Please try to answer in the comment box. The question is, which of the following factors affect processor selection. So there could be multiple answers, choose wisely. The first uh, option is performance. The second option is availability. The third option is tool support. The fourth option is all of the above. And the fifth option is none of the above. Please go on. Please go on and type the answers. Yes, uh, Shubham Agarwal has typed in as D. And Danish Malik has also typed in it as C. Yes, all of the above. So let's check whether that works. Yes, it's the correct answer. Processor selection is influenced by performance, availability, tool support, cost, packaging, heat dissipation, and so on. So good, good interaction from the audience. So now let's move on to the next topic. What's inside an embedded system? So you might know that an embedded system 
I hope you can see me. An embedded system uh, is made up of both software as well as hardware. Okay, so an embedded system is made up of both software as well as hardware layers. So uh, we will we'll be discussing first hardware layer in detail. This is the abstraction of the hardware layer. You can see the major components here. Uh, the uh, first, first element is processor. So the processor, as you know, processor executes instructions. And then uh, there is memory. RAM and ROM are the components of the uh, memory. RAM is uh, random access memory. ROM is read-only memory. RAM is used for live data processing, whereas ROM is used for uh, uh, storing firmware or maybe even device configuration parameters. So uh, memory and processor are one of are, are the most important components of the hardware layer. Now there is peripherals. Peripherals actually help the embedded system to, to communicate with the outside world. So in fact, when we write code for embedded system, we are actually writing code to make the uh, peripherals work. Now there is the clock circuitry. The clock circuitry is actually connected to all parts of the uh, all internal blocks of the uh, hardware layer. In fact, like like our human body, the heart pumps blood to all parts of our body. So without blood, we won't be we, we won't survive. Just like that, the digital circuitry in a hardware layer requires clock pulses. This clock pulse is provided by the clock the clock module. And finally, the power section actually powers uh, the entire hardware layer. So I hope you understood the hardware layer. These are the major components of hardware layer. It includes processor, peripherals, RAM, ROM, and clock. Now let's discuss the software layer. The software layer is actually made of uh, two uh, layers. One is application software layer, and the other is system software layer. So system software layer is actually an optional layer. System software layer is actually uh, uh, used only in those systems that employ operating systems. So um, for example, uh, you might have heard about Raspberry Pi, right? So Raspberry Pi uses Linux as its operating system. So in fact, when you write an application in Raspberry Pi, you're actually writing code on top of that operating system. So, but when the system requirements are minimal, you do not need an operating system. So application software layer is enough. But uh, when the system requirements are high, for example, it's a top box, it, its system, its requirements are very high because uh, it processes media. So it requires an OS. And in fact, Linux is the OS used inside a set dog box. So you have to write the application software on, on top of that. So this is all about software layer. So now I have a quiz for you. Let's see. Where is firmware stored? Uh, the, the, the options are RAM, CPU, input-output, ROM, and none of the above. So please type in the answer. I'm so sorry, uh, my power failed, but I think it's back now. You can see me clearly. Please type in the answer. Yes, the answer is ROM. Uh, Danish Malik is uh, responding as answer D. Yes, let's select the answer D. Yes, it's the correct answer. It is where the software configuration parameters are stored. So thank you for the answers. You all, you all are uh, actively interacting with the session. Thank you. Uh, so now let's move on to the next topic, the project phases. So as I said, embedded system goes through several phases. The first one is gathering requirements. So in this phase, the idea, the idea of embedded system is introduced. So this idea is revisited again and again until uh, it's finalized. The requirements are finalized. So this is the first phase. The next phase, the architecture of the embedded system is designed. So based on the uh, functionalities that we finalized in the previous phase, the architecture is designed here. So the architecture for both software as well as hardware is designed in this phase. Architecture is actually an abstraction of the embedded device. The next phase, we implement a design that is in fact, the entire development of the embedded system is actually happening in this phase. That is, we code and we design the circuit 
in this phase based on the architecture that was designed in the previous phase. Then we test the system. We know that our design might have errors, our code might have bugs. It has to be detected and removed. So testing the system removes, detects and removes errors and bugs. And then we move on to the uh, maintenance phase where the product gets deployed in the field. So in this phase, the user expects support like training, documentation and maintenance. So this is how a typical hardware development setup looks like. So there will be two systems. One is host and the other is target. The target is actually the embedded board that is being developed. The host is the PC where development actually happens. So the entire software tools are installed in the host PC. This host and the target board are actually connected by a communication link, which could be a serial link, a wired link like a, a Ethernet, or maybe even wireless link. So let's look at some of the tools involved in the embedded system development. The first category is utility tools. Utility tools actually help us to code or maybe maintain the version version of the, our, source, our source code or, main, or may, maybe even help us to load the software onto the uh, target board. So utility tools, an example is integrated development environment. It's a simple example is Arduino IDE. Arduino IDE helps us to write code. It is, it is an example of utility tool. The next category of tools is translation tools. We know that we write our code in high level language like C, C++, Java, and so on. But this language cannot be, could not be understood by the processor. It has to be translated to machine language. This translation process is done by translation tools. There are three translation tools. The first one is preprocessor, compiler, and the third one is linker. Preprocessor reorganizes and structures our code. Compiler compiles our code to create an object file. This object file is linked to the relevant libraries by the linker to create an executable. This executable is loaded onto the target board. And then finally, we have debugging tools where uh, you debug, you detect and debug the source code and remove the errors of bugs. Remote debugger, simulator, and emulator are examples of debugging tools. Emulator is the most powerful debugging tool. It is hardware based. This is the tool flow of embedded system development. So as you, as you saw, source file, we write code. The code is known as the source file and then it is compiled. So before uh, the compilation process actually involves pre-processing and compiling. This creates the object file. The object file is linked with libraries to create uh, executable by the linker. So you, see, you can see that the entire activity is happening in host PC. So once the executable is created, it is loaded onto the target board by the loader software. So now I have a question for you. Please answer if you know the answer. Source code restructuring is done by First question is a preprocess. First answer is option is preprocessor, linker, editor, compiler, and none of the above. Please type in the uh, comment box. Yes, Shubham, Shubham Agarwal has commented as preprocessor. I'm going with a. Yes, da uh, Danish Malik said C. No, it's not correct. Uh, Sachin Tiwari also said D. No. Answer A is the correct option. Preprocessing actually restructures and organizes the code. So now let's get back to the slide. And now we move on to project. So as I said, when we were discussing the objectives, we do a project in Tinker. So when you log on to Tinkercad, you will find that there are several examples and step-by-step -step tutorials in that uh, that will help you in doing the experiments. So before going on to Tinkercad, first let's see the requirements of our project. So the first requirement of our project is we have to display five text messages. Five text messages. Uh, five, five text messages are to be displayed on the LCD screen. So we are using a 16 by 2 LCD module. And this 16 by 2 LCD module uh, will be connected to an Arduino. So using that, we have to display five text messages on the LCD screen. This is our first requirement. Let's see the next requirement. We have to display the text on each button press sequentially. That is, there are five text messages 
and there is a push button switch. So when you press this push button switch, a text message has to get displayed and that too sequentially. So there are one, two, three, four, five messages. So it should come like one, two, three, four, and five. Let's see the next requirement, loop back to the first message. So after the fifth message, you have to loop back to the first message and display it. So let's see the messages. So the first message is IST webinar. The second message is embedded system. The third message is join the course. The fourth message is theory plus project. The fifth message is get certificate. So these are the five messages that you have to display on the 16 by two LCD module. So the 16 by two LCD module has two rows of 16 characters. So when you are selecting a string to get displayed on the LCD, you have to make sure that the string is less than or equal to 16 characters. If you go on and count the number of characters in the text messages that I've shown here, you'll find that it is either 16 or less than 16. So I hope you understood the requirements. And so now let's move on to the project. So this is this will be our schematic that should be uh, wired in Tinkercad. So let's move on to Tinkercad and wire this schematic. We have to select Arduino Uno, LCD module, and push button. So this will be the Tinkercad uh, window that when you log in, you will be taken to a window like this. And from there, you have to select this new button and you have to select circuit. Tinkercad could be used for 3D design and also coding. So now we are going to wire the circuit. So select circuit. So you have to be patient with Tinkercad because this is a virtual uh, platform uh, based on your internet speed. It will take time. So this will be the page where you will be wiring the circuit. So this is how your workspace will look like. This, this blank space is where you will be wiring your circuit. On the right side, you have the component uh, toolbar uh, from where you can select the components and uh, drag it to the workspace. Now, on top of the uh, toolbar, you will see a button start simulation. So this button will help you uh, start the simulation. We will see this uh, in sh uh, shortly. So let's wire the circuit according to the requirement. So first you drop down, select the drop down menu and select Arduino and scroll down, select and drag the two wire LCD component. Place it appropriately. Okay, so now you have selected Arduino and uh, uh, LCD module. Now you have to select push button. So for that, select basic in the drop down menu and click and drag push button and a resistor to the workspace. So now you have to connect this push button onto the uh, Arduino Uno. So you select wire and connect one of the terminals of push button to the, uh, to the resistor and set connect the resistor to negative supply. I will show you where the negative supply is. So this is where the negative supply is. You can see a minus sign here on the uh, bottom right side of breadboard. So you can see that minus sign, that is where the negative supply or ground is provided. So you have to connect the uh, wire to that point. You can see several dots in the wire. This is actually provided by Tinkercad to make your alignment perfect. So since we have connected this wire to ground, it's appropriate to color it as black. So we colored it as black. Now we have to connect the other terminal to positive supply. So you do the same and take it to the positive. You can see the plus sign to the right of the uh, breadboard that is at this point. And since you have connected this wire to the positive supply, you color it as red. So I think this is understood by, by, you, by you guys. Now we'll connect the opposite terminal to one of the pins of Arduino Uno. So we are going to connect it to digital pin seven. Let's color it as pink. Just for, there is no significance for that, but just to stand it as, just for a standout uh, look, we give it as a pink colored wire. So, okay, this is how your wiring should look like. 
Now, by default, Tinkercad actually includes a code in it. So if you go on and run this start simulation button, you will see a default message on the LCD. So this will help you. This will uh, make you understand that you're working, your 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 circuit is working perfectly. So let's run this simulation. Yes, it is showing a hello world string. So uh, our working, our our circuit is working perfectly. So I will explain why uh, the uh, push button switch is connected in this manner. So uh, you have a push button switch. Push button switch is a momentary switch. So when you press the button, the circuit gets completed. So when it gets completed, the five volt supply, that is this red point, this, this plus sign where, it, where the five volt is coming in, that reaches the switch. And that five volt is also available at this digital pin seven. This happens only when you press the button. When you release the button, it is the ground supply, this is the ground point that gets connected to digital pin seven. That is, this negative point gets connected to uh, digital pin seven. That means you get zero volts at digital pin seven. So when you press the button, you get five volt at uh, pin seven. When you release the button, you get zero volt at pin seven. So I hope you understand this. Now we have to code this. So for that, you have to press this code button. So it will take you to a code block uh, type of thing. You have to select text block, select the text block. Now, as I said, Tinkercad uh, includes a default code. We are not using that code. So I'm going to delete it. I'm going to delete the entire code provided by Tinkercad because I have already completed the code. And since we have very uh, little time to uh, do this, I have already completed code and I will be putting it in uh, in this section and i'll be explaining it in detail one by one so please uh, be attentive so first we'll see the lcd section so this is the code that is going to uh, interface lcd with arduino you know so the documentation is given here you can see that the lcd is hd double four seven eight zero type what does that mean the lcd module actually has an ic called hd double four seven eight zero so in fact, when we write code in Arduino, you know, we are in fact actually communicating with this particular IC. So this IC will act as slave IC and the Arduino, you know, will act as the master board, master IC. So this master slave connection, it comes often in embedded systems. This is a term that you have to understand because there are several communication protocols that run in this manner, master and slave. So HD44780 is the IC in LCD module on which uh, to which we are communicating. So be, be, below that, the, 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 the pinout of LCD is given. We won't be going to the entire details. We will be only referencing the relevant ones. So the register select pin of LCD is connected to pin number 12, which is the orange wire. The enable pin of LCD is connected to digital pin 11, which is the yellow wire. And the D4, D5, D6, and D7 are data pins through which the data and command are passed to LCD that is connected to uh, 5, 4, and 5, 4, 3, and 2, which is green, blue, blue again, and violet. VSS is ground pin, and VCC is 5 volt, uh, as you know. Then there is this potentiometer. You can see this round thing. This blue round thing you see is potentiometer. What it does is it actually helps to control the contrast of LCD module. So the LCD module has a pin known as contrast. So you have to select a potentiometer and connect one end of that potentiometer to po positive supply and the other end to negative supply. And the middle point, that is the wiper of the potentiometer, has to be connected to the contrast pin. So these are very detailed things. So please uh, learn about these things. These are very important. Now, I think I have covered the uh, basic uh, documentation of LCD. Now let's see how to include this in our code. So first, you have to include liquid crystal dot H like a header file onto your code that is shown here. Now, next to it, you can see another routine. This routine actually connects the library with our Arduino code. So you can see some parameters passed to this particular routine. Routine means functions. Routines and functions are uh, interchangeable. OK. So uh, you can see some parameters passed to this uh, routine. So you can see that the parameters are actually the pin numbers to which the LCD uh, pins are connected to Arduino. You know, 12 is RS, register select. 11 is enable pin, 5, 4, 3, and 2 are actually data pins. So I hope you understood the basic documentation as well as the method to interface LCD with Arduino. You know, this it's very simple. Now let's go on and edit and put uh, the code to connect 
the push button. So you can see that I have included three variables, button state, previous button count, button state, previous button count, and button count. So button state actually stores the state of the push button. So when you press the push button, as I said, there, uh, you will have a 5 volt at digital pin 7. When you release the button, there will be 0 volt at digital pin 7. So this 5 volt point is this 5 volt state is known as high and this 0 volt state is known as low. So button state is used for storing the state. Now there is another variable button count. What does this button count store? The button count stores the number of times the button was pressed. So there is one more variable previous button count. We will talk about it later when I explain the uh, next code. So for the time being, you can ignore this particular line. So you, you just have to remember button count and button state. Button count stores the number of press, number of times the button was pressed and button state stores the state of the push button. So this is the code used for uh, reading the push button. So first, what you do is you, you read the, uh, you digital read the uh, input seven, that is pin, pin seven is read and the state is stored in the way and the variable button state so it could be high or it could be low if you have pressed it this button state will be high if you haven't pressed it the button state will be low so if button state is high what do you do you increase you increment the button count so if the value of button count you have incremented is up is greater than or equal to five you reset to zero you also reset the state to low because once you have uh, acknowledged the state of the button you have to reset to low so this is how button push button So push button. So this is how a uh, push button is interfaced with Arduino. So I hope you get, you understood uh, the code that I have given here. So now let's move on to include next code. We are going to include the Arduino's setup routine. So you know that Arduino has two main routines. One is setup and the other is loop. Setup routine is actually used for setup routine is actually used for initialization. So we have two modules here that need to be initialized. One is LCD and the other is push button. So LCD has to be initialized using LCD begin routine or LCD begin function. So you can see that LCD begin has parameters as 16 and two. 16 is the number of characters per row and two is the number of rows. So this is how in LCD is initialized. And then you have to initialize the digital pin seven as input because you are pressing the push button to read the input. So you have to initialize digital pin seven as input that is done by this second line. Now let's include the loop routine where the entire activity is actually happening. Okay, this is the loop routine. So let's, so as you know, in the loop routine, two main activities happen. The first one is the button has to be read and based on that, the display has to be updated. So two activities, the button has to be read, and based on that, the display has uh, the display has to be updated. So first, I will go through how the display is uh, updated. So just like you write in your notebook, you, uh, you start from the first position, or maybe you, when, you, when you're typing a document, you start from the first, first position. You have to place your cursor, just like that in the LC here also, you have to place the cursor of LCD. So you have to set the cursor of LCD, at zero, zero, that is zeroth character and zeroth row. Then you can update the LCD. For the time being, you ignore this line. I will come to it later. Okay, so you have uh, set the cursor position at zero, zero. Now we check the value of button count variable. If the button count variable is zero, you display IST webinar. If it is one, it, you display embedded system. If it is two, you join the course. If it is three, theory plus project. If it is four, you get certificate. That is the, that is how the display gets updated. So now coming back to this line, see our requirement is you have to update the LCD only when the button is pressed. You don't have to update the LCD uh, every time the loop routine runs. You know that the loop routine runs continuously. The speed of Atmega is the speed of Arduino Uno, the speed at which Arduino Uno board runs is 16 megahertz. That is the loop routine tries to run at every 62.5 nanosecond. That is the loop routine tries to run at every 62.5 nanoseconds. So if, if, if the loop routine is running at that speed, it will try to update the LCD at that speed. 
that is very inefficient. So we have to slow it down. We have to update the LCD only when the button is getting pressed. So what we do is every time we display on the LCD, we store the value of button count to previous button count also. So then we check here. That is only when button count and previous button count are different. That is the button count has incremented by a button press. There is a change. So we have to update the LCD and the update process happens. I hope you understood how the display uh, routine or the display function is happening. So just as I said about just as I said earlier, two activities are happening in loop. One is reading the button, and the other is uh, displaying the LCD or updating the LCD. So the reading reading the button uh, function has been invoked just below the display section. Now you can see a delay routine, delay 100 milliseconds just below read button. Why do you need it? See, as I said, loop routine is running at 62.5 nanoseconds. It is very fast compared to our finger. So you, you place your finger on push button and you remove it. That, that delay is around uh, somewhere around 100 milliseconds. So just imagine how many 62.5 nanoseconds are there in 100 milliseconds. There are numerous uh, 62.5 nanoseconds in 100 milliseconds. So that means uh, until the, uh, our finger is released from the button, our Arduino thinks that the button is pressed continuously. So that will create false presses. This has to be avoided. So you are in, you are delaying by 100 milliseconds so that the loop routine runs at 100 milliseconds. So you effectively uh, remove the false presses. I hope you understand this, understood this point. This, this, tech, this method is also known as switch debouncing. Switch debouncing. I hope you, you take it down and you can uh, refer later uh, through internet what is switch debouncing. So this switch debouncing is actually a method to remove false switch presses. So our code is complete. Let's try to run it. So press simulation button and wait for Tinkercad to work. OK, our first message is getting displayed. Now we press the push button. You can see a simulator clock running on top of the uh, Tinkercad window. You have to understand that if the clock is running normally, our, our, our internet speed is OK. But if the clock is running slowly, that means our internet speed is slow. So that means it will, so that means the simulation will also run slow. So you have to be patient with the simulation. You, you have to keep on pressing the push button for the message to get updated on the LCD. OK, I am pressing the switch button. You can see the message is changing on LC. So after the fifth message, the first message has to get displayed. So now it is good to get. So the first message got displayed. So our uh, code is working perfectly. So now let's go to code again. I have one more thing for you in the code. So uh, we will extend this project requirement to one more point. This let's let's uh, extend this project requirement to one more point. So what we do is we are, I'm going to comment this section of the code and I'm enabling this part of the code. So what this code does is instead of, uh, we, we are not going to wait for push button. We are, we, are, we are going to ignore the push button and we are going to display messages on the LCD module every second. So every second, the message has to get displayed on the LCD module. That is our idea. So uh, let's see whether it is working. So uh, before that, the code is shown here. We increment the button count every time the loop runs, uh, means every time the loop runs. And if it is greater than or equal to 5, we reset it as 0. So we have to display the message on message at every second. So what we do is we put a delay of 1,000 millisecond, which is 1 second. I hope you understood the code. Let's run it. I'm running. I'm Okay, the first message got displayed. Keep an eye on the simulator clock that is running on top of the Every second you can see that the message is updated. So now it's second two. You have see, you can see the next message. I hope you understand that exercise. So that completes our project. And now we have a quiz. I have a, qu I have a question for you. So please try to answer if you know the answer. So
So the question is, the IC, the IC used in the 16 by 2 LCD module is option A at mega 88, option B, uh, pick 16 of 84, option C is HD double four seven eight zero, option D is DM365, option E is ESP32. Please type in the answers in the comment box. Yes, the answer is HD double four seven eight zero. As I said, HD double four seven eight zero acts as a slave IC. Arduino Uno acts as the master board. So the master board communicates with HD double four seven eight zero. Yes, is the IC used in the sixteen by two LCD module? Host processors like Atmega three twenty eight P and Arduino Uno communicate with HD double four seven eight zero to display on LCD. So that completes our project, and we move on to the case study. Okay, so we are going to have a look at a specific uh, problem. The problem is burglar alarm. So what is a burglar alarm? A burglar alarm is actually an intruder alert system. It is used to prevent theft, robbery, and protect one's premises. So if a robber or a thief enters your premises, what happens is an alarm goes off, like, uh, like a siren, it goes off. See, so, so burglar alarm could be a very simple one or could be a very advanced one, like CCTVs, sending SMS, sending mails, and things like that. What we are going to do is we are actually going to see a simple uh, burglar alarm uh, employing Arduino Uno. First, let's see its block diagram. So you can see I have shown the computing element as Arduino Uno here, and I've, and I've connected a PIR sensor to one of its pins. So PIR sensor is a motion sensor. If a motion happens in front of a PIR sensor, the PIR sensor sends a signal to Arduino. The Arduino detects this signal and activates an alarm. It keeps it alarm. It activates the buzzer, buzzer alarm. The buzzer keeps sounding until human intervention happens. This human intervention happens via a reset switch that is shown on the right side. So when a motion happens, PAR sensor in a, a PAR sensor intimates the Arduino. The Arduino activates the buzzer alarm. The buzzer alarm keeps on sounding until uh, a user comes and presses the reset switch. So this is how a simple uh, uh, burglar alarm works. This is the basic block diagram of a simple burglar alarm. One thing I, I, would, I would want to say to you is that you have to think in this manner. So you can you can look around and, and try, try to create the hardware block diagrams of, of embedded devices around you in this way that I have shown. So that will actually reinforce your learning. Now let's see the software block diagram. So just like we did the project, first we have to initialize the components. So first we initialize Arduino, buzzer, and the PAR sensor, and then we wait for motion detection. So if the motion has happened, what does what it does is it 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 sounds the siren, and it keeps on sounding the siren until the reset switch is pressed. So once the reset switch is pressed, we start all over again. So this is the software flow diagram of uh, Burger Alarm. So now I have a quiz for you. I have a question. Please try to answer. So PIR sensor is, there are five options, peripheral infrared, proximity infrared, pulsed infrared, programmable infrared, and processed infrared. So please type in the answer. Uh, Bharat has given it as A. Shubhajit has given it as A. And Rajesh has given it as A. Danish Malik has given it as B. Let's try B. It is proximity infrared sensor. That is the answer for PIR. These are very commonly used in most embedded systems. You can check in internet. So I think that completes our webinar. So thank you all for attending this. Over to you, Manpreet. Thanks, Mahini, for the amazing webinar. I'm sure we all got to learn a lot today. So I think before we open the floor to our audience for the questions, I wanted to ask you something. And my question is that as somebody who is eagerly interested in learning more and uh, who is like completely new to this domain, what is the right path for me? And also, what are the career opportunities? Yeah, Manpreet, see, uh, see, for anyone passionate about embedded systems, I would say this is a very exciting phase because there is a lot of innovation happening and that too at rapid pace. For example, uh, innovations are happening in, at, in the Internet of Things, 
स्मार्ट सिटीज ऑटोमोटिव मशीन विशन मशीन लर्निंग और डीप लर्निंग रोबोटिक्स हेल्थ केयर एंड कंज्यूमर इलेक्ट्रॉनिक प्रोडक्ट्स सो इवन इन सेक्टर्स लाइक स्पेस वेर वंस ओनली गवर्नमेंट एंटिटीज हैड स्कोप नाउ प्राइवेटली फंडेड आर एंड डी कंपनीज आर इनोवेटिंग सो एंड इवन इफ इफ यू लुक एट दी सम ऑफ द इनिशिएटिव बाय बाय द सेंट्रल गवर्नमेंट दे आर डूइंग सम मैसिव इनिशिएटिव लाइक ब्रिंगिंग इन for uh, vedanta and fox con to start a semiconductor plant in gujarat that is a recent news it is a very promising um, initiatives so all i can see is uh, some uh, bright opportunities there but just because these opportunities are there you, you, know, you won't get job you will get job only if you learn so you have to have a good uh, understanding of the uh, subject see uh, embedded system is actually an interdisciplinary subject you have to be adept at software engineering you have to be adept at hardware engineering you have to be adept at maybe mechanical engineering sort of because when you are making a product so um, for a beginner this could be very overwhelming so fortunately intern shala has a, has a course on embedded systems with a um, lot of modules and several modules are specifically intended for like there is a that's one module specifically scheduled for Uh, hardware one module specifically scheduled for software there is an entire module dedicated for case studies even a digital ip camera case study is being provi- is, is provided in that uh, module then they, then we even deal with print essential essential c programming we even deal with um, arduino programming and finally these are all theory sections and finally once you complete all these theory sections you you are given a project module where you do a very good project that actually reinforces the entire theory you have learned uh, in that course so these are the opportunities uh, that's available and this is how you you move forward you learn you learn through courses and indian shala has that has a very good course on embedded systems and i urge all the students to join that course and uh, one more thing from my personal side like um, uh if somebody is choosing this embedded system as a career move i would say that is one smart option because uh like if you are a software engineer it, it, maybe you could be an electronics engineer and you might get in you might get an it job perfect you you will get a job okay that, that i'm okay with it but as an electronics engineer i would want to work in um, electronics field and, the, and 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 embedded systems uh, provides me with um, that um, opportunity so i will also get some kind of a uh, work satisfaction in that and most importantly embedded system engineers might be uh, uh, might be like they they might be working uh, in one of the some of the most advanced technologies some cutting edge technologies uh, before some people so they could be the first people who could be working on that technology on the entire planet so these are some perks that come along with um, uh, working in embedded systems so i would say if you are passionate about this you make this career option and it will be greatly rewarding over to you manpreet absolutely so as uh, main rightly said you can now become the number one choice of recruiters with our embedded systems training and the link of that training is in our description and we are also giving a special flat 80% off on our embedded systems and all our other practical based online trainings and all these trainings come with a 100% placement assistance so you can just go on and check out the embedded system trainings and also check out the other trainings and this offer is only valid till 23rd so like again just go on and enroll right now and maybe now you can take up some questions from our audience yeah students if you have any questions to me right now please type in the comment box i'll pick some and answer please please go on and type inside the comment box i'm actually waiting for your questions you can ask me questions on this particular topic if you have anything please go on so shaib ali has uh, put a question sir i am currently in final year and i can only see it companies offering jobs is there a shortage of jobs in embedded systems no no 
there are a lot of companies coming up if, if you look at our news recently there are a lot of startups that's coming hardware sector as i said even in space sector now privately funded r and d companies are innovating so you have to be uh, on the lookout but to apply for those jobs you have to learn you need to be very good at uh, uh, circuit designing as well as uh, coding there are a lot of opportunities there is no shortage of jobs just be on the lookout of jobs uh can we use switch case in the programming instead of if, if else yes absolutely sure you can definitely use because my time limit is just 45 minutes i had to complete it uh, within the time limit that's why i used if else switch case is perfectly all right uh, ms has ms has commanded as DS, dsp programming is must for embedded developers yeah, i think that looks like a comment So Ayush Sharma has put as, I want internship in field of embedded systems. So what I do, please, please join Indian Shala's uh, platform and uh, check for internship that they are offering a lot of internships in embedded systems. And also do join this course also. That will be great, greatly helpful for you. What are the key skills required to pursue a career in IoT? Obviously, uh, microcontrollers and coding. These two things are very much needed. And even cloud engineering is also required. You have to know a little bit about uh, cloud engineering also. So sure, I, think, I think that that would yeah. be all. Yeah. So thank you so much, Maheen. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We really hope you enjoyed today's session. And if you want to watch more such videos, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon. We have a lot of incredible sessions planned out for you in the future. So if you press the bell icon, you'll get notified about all of them. And if you want to get these updates on Telegram, we also have a Telegram community. So you can go on and also join that. The link is in the description. And thank you again for joining us today. We hope you really enjoyed the session. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. तेरी ग्रेजुएशन कंप्लीट होने वाली है और तू यहाँ बैठ के मटर छील रहा है कोई ट्रेनिंग व्रेनिंग कर ले ताकि तेरी नौकरी लग जाए करने को तो कुछ भी कर लू पर उसके बाद नौकरी कौन देगा शुरू कहा से करूँ यार इंटर्नशाला ट्रेनिंग से डिजिटल मार्केटिंग वेब डेवलपमेंट डेटा साइंस एनालिटिक्स और पाइथन जैसे बहुत सारी ट्रेनिंग है जिनसे हो सकती है जॉब पक्की ट्रेनिंग सेलेक्ट कर और अपना करियर शुरू कर और वो भी हंड्रेड प्लेसमेंट असिस्टेंट्स के साथ इंटर्नशाला ट्रेनिंग शुरुआत यही ऐसी